This talks about data types created by programmers. The C language allows programmers to create data types by using structures. The word in C is struct. You can find sample programs in this GitHub repository. Let's first see some examples of struct before we explain why it is necessary creating new data types. The first example is a new type called vector and it has three attributes, x, y, and z. In this example, all attributes are integers. Please notice the syntax. At the top, we need to say type define struct, followed by open brace. The attributes are listed between the open brace and the close brace. After the close brace, you can give a name of the data type. In this example, the name is vector. From now on, vector is a new data type. Please remember adding semicolon after the type. If you forget the semicolon, GCC may get confused and produce dozens of error messages. These error messages can be solved by a single semicolon. Usually, a new data type has its own header file. This vector structure has a header file called vector.h. In the second example on the right side, we can see that the attributes may have different data types. The first three attributes x, y, and z are integers. The next attribute t is double. The last attribute name is an array of 30 characters. Why do programmers want to create new data types? The most important reason is to organize information better. Relevant information should be put together. Consider a three-dimensional vector. It is better to put the three directions x, y, and z together. If you are writing a program related to transportation, you may want to have a data type called car. Inside this car data type, there are attributes such as the engine size, the size of fuel tank, the number of horsepower, the number of seats, and the fuel efficiency. If you are writing a program about buildings, you may want to have a data type called house. Each house has attributes such as the number of bedrooms, the number of bathrooms, the size of living rooms, whether the house is a basement, etc. We need to distinguish the concept of data types and the instances of these. Data types are sometimes called abstract data types because data types are different from concrete examples. Car is a data type and it does not refer to any specific car. A car is a concept. Your car is an instance of the car type. We cannot say the car type has 5 seats or the fuel tank is 15 gallons. Instead, when we say a car has 5 seats, we refer to a specific car, that is, an instance of car. Similarly, an integer is a data type. We cannot say integer is 5. Instead, we can create an instance of integer and assign 5 to this particular integer. C is not an object-oriented programming language. In an object-oriented language, a class is a data type, similar to the concept of a structure. An instance of a class is called an object. In other words, an object is an instantiation of a class. In this We'll borrow the terminology from object-oriented languages. We will use the word object to refer to an instance of a data type. By creating new data types and organizing relevant information together, it is easier to write complex programs without mistakes. Imagine that we cannot create a data type called car. Then, we have to remember to keep track of the information about cars, such as sizes of engines and sizes of fuel tanks. Without a structure, it is very easy to forget putting these attributes together and programs will have mistakes. 
Another advantage of a structure is that the attributes can be passed to a function as an argument all at once. Think of about the second example of the vector structure. The structure has five attributes. It is possible passing all attributes together as a single argument to a function. Without the structure, the five attributes have to become five arguments. Another reason is to maintain consistency. Let's imagine that you create a data type called address. When someone moves, the person's address needs to change the street number, the street name, maybe the city and the zip code. When the information about address is put together, programmers are more likely to remember and the data can be maintained properly. Some object-oriented programming languages, such as Java and C++, use classes instead of structures. It is possible to protect the attributes of classes from being accidentally changed. C is not object-oriented so this feature of data protection is not available. Let's see how the vector structure can be used. This is an example creating a vector object called v1. This v1 object will reside in the stack memory. We can assign values to the attributes using v1.x, v1.y, or v1.c. What is the address of v1.x? The address is determined by the GCC compiler and the operating system together. In this example, the address of v1.x is 300. After the address of v1.x is decided, the address of v1.y is the address of v1.x plus the size of v1.x. Since x is an integer, it uses 4 bytes. Thus, the address of v1.y is 304. The address of v.c is the address of v1.x plus the size of x and the size of y. Since both x and y are integers, the address of v1.c is 308. This slide shows another example using the vector structure. v1 is the same as the previous example. This example adds another object called v2. This is the output of the program. I will explain the program in more details. It is possible initializing all attributes of v2 to 0 using this method, brace with only one zero inside. It is also possible assigning the values of v1's attributes to v2's attributes. Please notice that assignment is the only allowed operators for structures. C does not allow operator overloading. C does not allow any other operators for structures such as not equal, less than, less than or equal, greater than, greater than or equal, increment or decrement. After the assignment, v1's x, y, and z and v2's x, y, and z have the same values. However, they occupy different memory space. Thus, changing v1.x does not change v2.x. Changing v2.y does not change v1.y. Let's take an even closer look of the program by understanding how the stack memory changes. When we create the v1 object, the space for three integers, v1.x, v1.y, and v1.z are put on the stack memory. Since the object has not been initialized, the values are marked U, meaning unknown. The next three lines assign values to the three attributes, X, Y, and Z. Next, we create a vector object called V2. All attributes are initialized to zero. Please notice that V2 occupies different memory space in the stack memory from the space for V1. C allows using the equal sign to assign the attributes values from V1 to V2. Because V1 and V2 use different memory space, modifying V1's X does not affect V2's X. 
Modifying V2's Y does not affect V1's Y. The next example shows passing an object to functions. This is the program's output. The program has two functions called print vector and change vector. In the main function, the vector's attributes are 3, 6, and minus 2. This vector is passed to the change vector function as an argument. The vector's attributes are changed to 5, minus 3, and 7. After leaving the change vector function and back to the main function, the vector's attributes are still 3, 6, and minus 2. What is happening? What does this mean? When passing the vector object v1 from main to the change vector function, a new object is created for the argument. This object is called v and it is on the stack of the called function. The attributes are copied from the main function to the change vector attribute by attribute. Because the argument v occupies different memory space from the memory space for v1, Changing v inside the function has no effect on the v1 object inside the main function. If you are familiar with Java, Python, or C++, this argument passing in C is different. In Java or Python, passing an object means passing by reference. Thus, the changes inside the function will be kept in the calling function when the call function finishes. In C++, you can choose to pass by reference. In that case, C++ is the same as Java or Python. C does not have the concept of passing by reference. Calling a function using an object means creating a new object on the stack memory. What should we do if we want to change the vector inside the main function? We will use the same method as before passing the address. In this example, the main function calls the change vector function using the address of v1. The function's argument must be a pointer. To get the address of v1, add ampersand in front of v1 when calling the function. Inside the function, we use the arrow to refer to x, y, or z. The arrow is written by using the minus sign followed by the greater than sign. Please notice that inside the change vector function, v is a pointer and stores the address of v1's dot x. This slide shows another way to initialize the attributes. v2 is a local object. The attributes can be assigned by using dot x, dot y, and dot z. We can use the left-hand side rule of v. Asterisk v equals v2 will copy the values of v2's attributes to the memory pointed by v. The print vector function uses the right-hand side rule of v. The attributes are read from the memory address pointed by v and copied to the argument v of print vector. When should we use dot and when should we use arrow? The rule is simple. If it is a pointer, use arrow. If it is not a pointer, use dot. Consider this example. An object v is created. Since it is not a pointer, we use v.x. A pointer called vp is created and its value is the address of v. Because vp is a pointer, we need to use arrow. We can also have a structure using another structure. This example creates a structure called date of birth. This structure has three attributes for year, month, and date. Another structure called person contains two attributes. The first is a pointer for name. The second is the date of birth structure. From this example, we can see that it is possible creating a structure using another structure. 